Thank you very much for sitting down with me, Jim. You talk about um, one of your patients in your talk, Jimmy. Can you tell us a little bit more about him? So I initially met Jimmy when he was six years old, and I tested him when he was eight years old. And when I tested him, um, he came out with a, an IQ of about 158, 100 being an average score, and his math scores were as high as 178. But the thing with Jimmy is he did all the math in his head without writing it down, and he was doing it as well as my students at Washington U could do. Yeah. So Jimmy, and I knew immediately, as soon as I met him when he was a six-year-old guy, it's like, man, I'm in the presence of greatness. This, this guy is really going to go some places. But he has some issues. He, he has uh, trouble making friends, and he has some social problems. And he's smarter than everybody around him, which makes it really hard when you're just a, a little person in the first, second, third grade. But both of his parents are really involved. They're, his mom is a special ed teacher, and his dad's an engineer. So the prognosis is really great for him because they'll get the right kind of help. And my hope for Jimmy is that they will recognize him for his strengths. And I just saw a study two days ago that says, and I've been saying this for a long time, that acceleration is great for really gifted people. So you let them go as far as they can. So if he's in the third grade in college doing math, that's totally fine. So when you talk about people like Jimmy that you call twice exceptional people, you know, what is that process? What is the kind of, you know, treatment or the programs? Uh, treatment isn't the right word, but... No, it is. It, okay. it's, it's the right word. So really, truthfully, if uh, I were the czar of the world, everyone would be tested, every human being, so that we could find strengths and then find weaknesses. So you start there. And it's really interesting because I use some rating skills and I sort of say, hey, what do you think your strengths are? And it's funny because some people say, oh, I'm really great at this, when in fact they're not. And so you do the testing, and it's like, well, you think you're really visual spatial, but you're actually more kinesthetic, or you're a combination of visual, auditory, kinesthetic. So once you have a really good idea about how the nervous system works, the, the next thing that you want to try to do then is find the right match educationally. Is it a private school? Is it a public school? A gifted program? And then a lot of times there can be types of treatment that go with it. So if the person has anxiety, or depression, you would use cognitive therapies. Or if they have ADHD and they're just wildly disorganized, you help them with time management, organization, follow through. Sometimes it's educating folks on medication because there are two schools of thought. Some parents come in saying, I will never use medication, no matter what you say. And then other families are, can we medicate before I even get them out of the waiting room? So what is your approach to medication? It's a really good question. Very conservative. It's the last thing that I recommend. So we try to get people to understand their nervous system, try to get them to regulate their sleep, try to get them to regulate their diet, their water intake, their exercise, how they study. So we go at it behaviorally first. And if you make all those changes and the person still isn't successful, that would be the time to think about medicine. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about, you know, are they successful and you talk about you know what you're moderating what are you going for what is successful well that's a super good question I'm not really sure I have an exact answer for that but um, working to your greatest potential would probably be the best success story uh, avoiding some of the pitfalls is probably more pragmatically the case in what happens. So not developing low frustration tolerance, that's huge. So if you struggle early on in the first, second, third grade, you can unplug academically when in fact really the basic skills are the things you're going to struggle with and not the higher level stuff. So if you're a dyslectic person and you're not doing the sound symbol relationship, which is characteristic of that disorder, you might get turned off on reading. And you, not, you may want to not be a reader when, in fact, you can be a really good reader with some modifications. Mm -hmm. So functionality is probably the real answer to be as well-rounded and, and functioning in society as much as is possible. Mm -hmm. And that kind of takes me to our society. Um, you talk in when you're up on stage about how you would like to see society change to better accommodate twice exceptional people. Um, what are some of the things that you'd like to see different? 
Well, I have to compliment the TED folks because I'm severely dyslectic and they gave me an accommodation. I actually have a stand up there which they don't like and I have some notes and they're actually pictures, they're not really words, but it sequences it for me which is super helpful. So I'm going to be doing that and I'm going to identify that as an accommodation and how much help it is. What I would like to see the world do is to accommodate people. Um, so for example, if they are dyslectic, to have audio readers, that's, that's a very easy accommodation. Extended time on exams is another thing that really helps people. It can be enormous. A person uh, with one of the alphabet tests, if the average is 21, uh, somebody who can be a 4.0 student can get an 18 on one of the alphabet tests, but with extended time can get a 30. And so it's dramatic differences in terms of what they can demonstrate if they have the extra time. But really, an awareness would be cool. I, I, I would like to see people be aware of what the condition is, because at one time, gifted and special ed never communicated. And still, there are some frictions there between the two, and most of these twice exceptional human beings really need both, the gifted and that. You know, on a cultural level, I'd like to see the gatekeeping mechanisms open. I'm tired of seeing human beings stopped because of a basic skill problem. So somebody who's bad at spelling but is a great writer, well, there are ways to get around spelling issues, you know? And really just acceptance. Uh, I would like to live in a world where we're just more accepting of differences. What do you think a world where it was normal to accommodate twice exceptional people um, would look like? What would be different about our world if this was something we did every day? Probably fewer systems. So it's like, hey, we're just going to create this for each person. and There aren't so many systems. There aren't so many gatekeeping mechanisms. Status quo would change, you know, and I really don't like status quo. Whenever I hear someone say, this is how we do it, it's like, well, really? Maybe there's another way to think about this. So changing the status quo is important. Um, I really would love to see our society um, appreciate certain groups more. You know, female human beings, number one. I'd like to see them much more represented. I'd like to have, see them have equal pay. I think that would be a really cool world for doing the same job as men. Uh, I really worry about minority human beings and giftedness because it can really get hidden in public systems and whatnot. So I'd love to see the czar of education say we're really going to scour the community for low-income humans who are gifted because they're gifted like anybody else at the same percentage as any other group. And um, you're wearing that particular ball cap for a reason, the 2E that's on the cap. Um, or first to twice exceptional, this is a term you came up with? I did not. I, I wish that I had. Now, here's the thing. This really came out in the early 1980s and people don't know about it. And I've had three or four folks here at this uh, talk ask about what's 2E? It's like, well, you're gonna find out here pretty soon, you know? Uh, so um, it, it's interesting that it, it, just, it just hasn't really gotten into the, the mindset of educators. Now, it's better than what it was, but I'm hoping that with the TED Talk, it's gonna move it forward. Yeah, I'd never heard of it um, until you. Can you take me back to when you first encountered this term? I can. <laughs> a thousand years ago, before you were born, I was, uh, I was dating a, a woman who was an expert in uh, gifted education, and she gave me four studies. And uh, as a result of those four studies, it launched my career, and it was on twice exceptional learners. You know, they called it gifted learning disabled back then, but... What was that moment when it clicked and you said, okay, this is, this is what I'm doing with my life? So when that happened, uh, I started with those four studies and then I expanded to the extant 54 studies that were in existence and read all of them. But even now, you know, the, uh, the number of studies really isn't all that high. I haven't checked it in a bit, but arguably there are probably only a couple of hundred studies on twice exceptional learners. There are 10,000 referee journal articles on learning disabilities. You know, and then when you get into the gifted nomenclature, there are another 10,000 referee journal articles about gifted. So it's still a small percentage of the human beings that are out there. But it was transformative. You know, I, I really, I, I felt like, and I know this is arrogant to say, I've said it before, but it's like, wow, this is why I'm on the planet. This is it. 